Hi, I'm Lou Eisen, and this is uh, Sunday afternoon's edition of Ring Talk. And today we're going to talk about the fight from February 15th, 1937 at the Palais Royale between Canadian uh, Lou Briard and the hairy Frenchman Marcel Phil. If you've ever seen pictures of Phil, he's balding, but he's got more hair on his shoulders than Sly Stone had on his head during his heyday. This guy was you know, Marcel Phil looked like a gorilla, just about. I've never seen anyone that hairy, and, and nor do I want to. It's not that I go looking for people like that, but that's how we look. Um, this was an interesting fight uh, because Briard, who was born in St. Eugene, Quebec, had already held the uh, New York State Athletic Commission's version of the middleweight title and the national, the NBA National Boxing Association's world middleweight title, and he lost him to Vince Dundee, but but uh, Phil was notorious when he fought at home. He was, he was, a, he was I never particularly liked him. And I went over his record recently. You got to give him credit. He was a good fighter. He started at 16 as a pro. And as he got older, he developed a lot of power in both hands. But this was the guy. You could tag him with a jab to the chin or right hand. He would grab his groin and go down and roll all over the canvas. And then the referee in France would roll in his favor. By disqualification even and that's what happened in this fight even though you know it, it never happened uh phil was born in saint dizier uh, it was a commune in outmar in france in uh may 29th 1904 and he had a great career he had a long career he had 136 fights 160 wins 49 ko's so he did have power 20 losses 10 draws and he fought and beat a lot of good guys uh, as i said he started boxing at a young age but as he got older and he developed power you know it, it occurred to him i'm doing my best with my jab my right hand to pack out all these points wins over guys and that you know that's a 15 round fight that's a lot of effort that goes into it if i could just knock him out and when he started to knock guys out he thought this is a much better way to fight you know if fight gets over sooner i save energy and uh, get to fight another day you know in 1928 he won the french middleweight title and captured the european title the following year and then um after losing his european uh, middleweight title he had a controversial fight in 1930 uh he won he loses the european middleweight title chrono let's go chronolog chronologically and then 15 more fights he wins, and then he defeats Gorilla Jones by a controversial 11th round disqualification to capture the National Boxing Association middleweight title. And, um, yeah, Blazers here says Yard did its thing. Yard went as far to, as far as his ability could carry him. But doing his thing was getting knocked out. He certainly did his thing. I, I don't put Yard down. He went out, you know, on his shield. His corner stopped it. He was willing to con continue but yeah bitter bf is the real deal i was watching that fight last night bitter bf never makes the same mistake twice in any fight he just doesn't he throws short as i was saying to eric before we were talking off air he he um throws short murderous punches he's technically sound he doesn't make mistakes he doesn't complain the cut over his eye was a headbutt didn't complain to his corner didn't complain to the referee just uh yeah and yard did look gassed by it at, at the end of it. it was a tremendous pace but you have to understand something you know on his birthday as they said in the broadcast better be able did two full workouts you know this is like 10 12 hours this is a guy that's doing 10,000 sit-ups 10,000 push-ups 10,000 chin-ups running 20 miles a day i mean bitter be could go 30 or 40 rounds if he had to at that level so getting back to uh, Marcel Phil, he, he, he fought Gorilla Jones and he was doing well against Jones, but Jones was very bitter after that. Jones hit him. Jones was warned once for a low blow and then he hit him again in the chin and it was called a low blow and he was disqualified. And Jones is really the first fighter at, at that time who came out and said, you know, his fights are fixed. You hit him in the chin. If you hurt him, if a shot to the head or the body, he's going to grab his groin and say, I got hit low. And the referee's going to side with him. And that's very frustrating. And uh, Jones had a great manager, Suey Welsh, who later went on to manage the immortal Art Hafey from Halifax, who knocked out uh, world 
uh, Bantamweight champion Ruben Oliveras when Oliveras moved up to featherweight. So Sui Welch was a great manager. Um, uh, yes, I agree with you, Blazers. Uh, Bivol Bitter Beef is the most intriguing fight that can be made besides Anthony Joshua versus Wilder. I don't think Wilder is going to get by Ortiz. Uh, um, or not Ortiz, excuse me, Andy Ruiz. I think once Andy Ruiz clocks him, he's done. Um, anyways, getting back to this fight. Phil was a journeyman for a long time, but then, as I said, he gained power in his hands. Uh, although he he held the NBA title, which was the recognized world middleweight title, it was taken away from him after a year because he hadn't defended it. So he still held the lightly regarded International Boxing Union title. story of Lou Briard is quite fascinating. Uh, if you look at any and all standards of pugilistic excellence, he's got to be one of the top 10 greatest Canadian fighters that ever lived. And... It's, uh, Bo Box Rex has him actually as the third greatest Canadian fighter that ever lived. But it's hard to do top 10 lists anymore because there's so many great fighters. You can't just really limit it to 10. But the reason why he was considered that is he held the undisputed world welterweight title and he held the undisputed world middleweight title. And you got to give him credit for that. So, and eventually went into the Boxing Hall of Fame in Canastota on a day that I was there. Uh, but he wasn't the first Canadian to do that. The first Canadian ever to hold two world titles in any weight division was the immortal George Dixon, and also a Hall of Famer, who held both uh, the, the bandweight and featherweight titles, lost them, regained them, and then invented the speed bag, excuse me, the heavy bag, and shadow boxing. And uh, Dixon may have been the greatest fighter pound for pound that ever lived. Uh, Briard fought most of his fights during the Great Depression. And if you look at the list of guys he beat, he beat Ben Jebby. Uh, whose real name is Jebatowski for the uh, the middleweight title. He beat Bob Olin before Olin became the light heavyweight champ. He beat the former middleweight champ, Mickey Walker. Mickey Walker. Well, Blazers, I don't know if Butte is number one. I don't know if you're joking or not. Uh, I, I, Butte is a great fighter. He was a great fighter, without a doubt, and a real gentleman. And I know that my mentor, Angelo Tendee, was very fond of him. Uh Briard also beat um, uh, Jimmy McLarnon, before McLarnon was the welterweight champion. He was McLarnon was taller than him, but McLarnon was not bigger than him. And this is the th interesting thing about Briard. You got to look at Briard. This is a guy who was five five and a half, but he had thick legs, huge neck, and they said he was built like a horse. He, he was just very strong, very heavy handed, and being heavy handed is a big asset, which because it means you don't have to tag a guy flush, right? You can hit him a glancing blow and still do tremendous damage. And this is important because he fought during the Great Depression. And during the Depression, although they scaled back prices for boxing tickets, which would never happen today, um, you know, money was still hard to come by. So people would wait six months, a year or two years, three years to save up enough money to go to a fight card. And if you were going to go to a fight card back then during the Depression, you didn't want to see stick and move fighters. You're paying your money. This is the dirty 30s. You wanted to see a brawl. Every fight had to be a brawl. And Lou Briard brought it every single fight. From the first round to the last round, he fought his heart out for the full 15 rounds. He went out there to kill you every single time that he fought. So people sitting in the cheap seats got their money's worth. And he wasn't a stylist, you know, he, he was more like a Rocky Marciano fighter. He was a straight ahead walk-in slugger, but he had tremendous strength and endurance. Uh, he was born May 23rd, 1911 to Joseph and Rose Alba Briard in St. Eugene, Quebec, which is, I mean, there's a reason they call Quebec La Belle Provence, the beautiful province. It's gorgeous. And so is St. Eugene. And... Briard was born three years before Canada's entry into World War I in 1914. Um, Blazers, yes, Canada has a rich boxing history. We have, I think, 14 people in the International Boxing Hall of Fame, including promoters, and Canada has, has had a world champion in every weight division and recently and in every, every decade. So, and if you check out my substack, Once Upon a Time in the Prize Ring, you'll see a lot of those fighters that I've written about them. Now, here's the interesting thing. So, Briard's family moves to Worcester, 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 Worcester uh, Massachusetts, 
boy, do I sound like a Canadian. I am a Canadian. In the year 1917, and he was just six years of age. This is very significant. Why is it significant? Because it's 1917, and Canada had entered World War I in 1914. And because they were from Quebec, uh, they moved. His father moved. His father was 38 at the time. They had to move to the state. Why? Because Sir Robert Borden, the Tory Prime Minister, Conservative Prime Minister of Canada, uh, brought in conscription, which meant all males, I think it was, I have the age written down here, but from the age of 20, I believe, to 45, had to enlist. But this was hugely unpopular in Quebec. And in the House of Commons, our parliament, you know, you, you have the Congress, we have the House of Commons, and it was in the state to have Congress, uh, were based on the British model of government. And so what happens is all the all the French members of parliament in the House of Commons and every person in Quebec, the entire province is outraged. This is not our war. And they were right. They said, this is an Anglophone war. You're defending Britain, even though France was involved in the war. The war shouldn't have happened. But every country in Europe ha had had treaties with every other country where if you're attacked, then I have to come to your defense, even though I have nothing, I have no problem with your attackers. And it's this war that, the war to end all wars. And the French Canadians in Canada, and they were correct, this is an Anglo war, it has nothing to do with us. And so because of uh, um, Joseph Briard's age at 38, he would have been called up to the military immediately. And then he would have been uh, sent to the killing fields in Europe. And he was sent down, Excuse me, he went down, he wasn't sent down, but he went down to the United States to Worcester, Massachusetts with his family. And he knew that in the States, because he was the husband and and um, the wife, Rosalba, and they had a young son, that he, and he was the only means of support, that he wouldn't get drafted. And it was a smart move on his part. So they go down to, to the States, to uh, Massachusetts, and his father has a job, his mother has a job, and they're able to, you know, the war ends within a year and it didn't affect their family. So, and one of the reasons it was such a big thing in Canada, of course, was Canada was the largest, second largest country in the world in landmass, but we were the smallest country, one of the smallest in terms of population. You know, we only had four or five million people in the entire country. So at that time we lost you know, we had 350,000 men and we lost quite a few of them uh, in, on the battlefields of Europe. So we had to have conscription. It was not, as I said, it was unpopular. And it was just like, it was, we, Canadians were just cannon fodder, according to the British military. Hey, Tom, and glad you're watching. And um, so because of that, uh, the conscription came in. So they go down to the States and, and you know, Briard did his career backwards. A lot of Canadians start their boxing in Canada and then go down to the States, they get polished and they get more opportunities there. And that still happens today. But Briard actually didn't, you know, because he was so young, he was six when they moved, he picked up his boxing in the United States, uh, started boxing when he was 12, 13, dropped out of high school when he was 15 or 16. And at that time, that wasn't uncommon. This was before the depression, but it wasn't uncommon to do that because it, you know, you wanted to help and add to your family's coffers. You wanted to help bring in money and having a you know a, a full high school education and then a college degree that was a luxury and he didn't think it was fair because his parents had put a roof over his head clothes on his back food in his belly he wanted to contribute so he got a job in a mill but he loved boxing and so every day after the mill regardless of how long and punishing the day was he went to the gym and he worked and worked and worked and worked on his boxing and he was lucky because he got spotted by Maurice Lemion and more importantly, he was also managed by Johnny Buckley. Now, Johnny Buckley should be a name that's familiar to you if you're a boxing fan or a historian, because Johnny Buckley managed uh, a lot of great guys. He managed Jack Sharkey to the world title, and um, he also managed uh, Paul Pender, Jack Sharkey to the world heavyweight title, and Paul Pender to the um, uh, middleweight world title over Sugar Ray Robinson, the immortal Sugar Ray Robinson. And uh, he was there when when um, uh, Sharky beat Max Schmeling for the title. They fought the first time; the title was vacant. Schmeling won uh, when Sharky was disqualified for hitting low. And then 
in the rematch. Actually, Sharkey had the better of it, but the decision was given to Shmuel. Uh, so he had a successful amateur career, Lou Briard. And on March 1st, 1928, he had his first professional fight, June 28th, uh, 1928, excuse me, was his first professional fight. March 1st, 1928 was his last amateur fight. He fought a guy named Billy Kratz. And Briard cracked him, KO'd him at 256 in the first round of a scheduled four round bout in Connecticut at Elks Park, Willamette, Connecticut. Uh, and Briard only weighed 140 pounds, so he was barely a welterweight for this fight. But even at that point, it was evident to people that um, Briard had a lot of power. And I just want to show you this again, if I can find the picture of him, which I have somewhere here, of uh, the great Lou Briard. Yes, that's him. Take a good look at him. Got a little closer. Very well muscled in his body, in his neck. You know, muscle legs. This guy came to fight. This guy could do damage. He was only five, five and a half. So uh, he only had a 71 inch reach, but as I said, he was incredibly strong. Now, the interesting thing about him was um, well, you would be incorrect, Blazers. Uh, Canada has a lot of fans, but rich boxing history, I digress. Um, now, <laughs> I'm trying to get through this. Uh, I could name you world champions. Canada's boxing history goes back to the 1860s. Um, so you have guys like George Godfrey, the black fighter from Prince Edward Island, who helped train George Bud Byers, who ended up training Sam Langford, all of them Canadian. Langford was maybe the greatest fighter that ever lived, although he was never given a college shop because of his skin color. He was going to fight Sat Stanley Ketchell after beating him in a preliminary bout, but then Ketchell was murdered. You have Tommy Burns, who was the world heavyweight champion. You have Johnny Kalan, who was the world uh, bantamweight champion, held it for a long time. Jackie Calero was the flyweight champion. Um, you have Lou Briard, who was the welterweight middleweight champion. You have the great baby faced assassin, Jimmy McLaren, who was the two time undisputed world welterweight champion. These are people that held up when there was only one title. That was it. You had the title then, you were the world champion. Don't forget, you also had Jack Delaney, Oliver Jack Delaney, who was the undisputed light heavyweight champion. Uh, so you had great champions in every weight division throughout boxing history. Plus we've had uh, Steve Molitor, we've had Matthew Hilton, uh, Davey Hilton Jr. So we've had world champions Arter Bitterbia, who's a Canadian citizen. So there's guys, and I could go back into the 1870s and 1880s. You know, George Dixon was the first black man to ever hold a world title. You have George LeBlanc, who beat the great original Jack Dempsey. You have George Fulgamis. So there's a lot of these great fighters. You just have to, yeah, Arturo Gotti was a world champion. Um, uh, so was uh, Lennox Lewis, who held it for almost 12 years. But I understand Blazers just interested in it. Um, and us in Canada, we're always trying to live up to that American ideal because we're overshadowed here by everything American. But Canadians have shone through and, you know, and won world titles. So that's, you know, without a doubt, undisputed world titles. And that's what makes uh, Briard's accomplishments uh, incredible because there was only one world champion at that time now briard there's an interesting thing about briard you have to understand something he was a converted southpaw now marvin Hagler was a converted southpaw maybe the greatest converted southpaw of all time and the way they found out he was a converted southpaw was before the ray leonard fight uh angelo dundee asked the kid to get Hagler's autograph and he said what hand did he sign with his right hand which meant that in, in training ray was circling away from Hagler's left, which is what Hagler's people wanted him to do, right? Because it was power in Hagler's right hand. The reason you turn a guy into a southpaw, a right-handed fighter, is because when you do that, and he's in this stance, his right hand, his power hand, is closer to the head of his opponent. So he's going to get more opportunities to turn the jab into a hook. That didn't happen with Luke Riard. He converted the southpaw, and it was really bizarre for a completely different reason. 
in one of his first pro fights. Um, Manny Pacquiao he was without a doubt a great southpaw. I don't know if he's the greatest ever southpaw because you're not, you know, you'd have to go back a couple hundred years and look at all the great southpaws in this sport. But I love Manny Pacquiao. He's definitely in the top three greatest southpaws of all time. And he's not a converted southpaw. He was he was born a southpaw, and, and you know, pound for pound, one of the top several fighters ever to have walked the face of this earth. So what happened with Briard was, in an early fight, when he was fighting Orthodox, he got caught at two right hands. First right hand broke two ribs. A couple rounds later, another one broke a third rib. He was in a lot of pain. And during the fight, he's covering up. The fight ends. And the thing is, this is the depression. So eight years ago, before I sold my house after I got divorced, I fell down a flight of stairs and I broke three ribs. Took me six months, took six months for them to heal, eight months for me to get used to, you know, just get used to walking again without favoring that side. So, Briard was fought during the depression. He had parents and he had a wife and he had a young kid. He couldn't take time off. Time off meant you didn't, you didn't pay rent, you didn't get clothes. So, he had to fight. He had no choice but to fight. And back then, guys, you'd see a guy wow, this was a 15-round brutal battle. And then he fight four days later. That was just the way it was. He only made money when he fought. So the best way for him to keep fighting and protect his injury was for him to turn southpaw. And that's what he did. He turned southpaw. Now, here's what's really bizarre about this. Over time, as a southpaw, he became more proficient as a left-hander than he did as an orthodox fighter. He, he would use his right hand basically to paw with his jab to set up his left hand, which was tremendous. However, he would use his right hand and the power in his right hand when he got in close and he started to throw uppercuts. Really in close, right up the middle, he'd start ripping his opponents. Otherwise, he had a devastating left hand. Most guys that turn south uh, don't have devastating left hands. It's the right hand for power hand, but regard. It was an orthodox fighter to turn that adage uh, on his head. So his first fight, his first world title fight, by the way, came in a seven-year fight. Now, that wasn't unusual back then. You know, guys would have 50, 60, 70 fights. Same thing with Ray Robinson. He had something like 80 or 90 fights before he got a world title. But that was more racism than anything else. But with Briard, there were so many great fighters at that time that could turn your lights out that for him to have to wait that long to have 70 fights it was just hard for the courts and you have to remember too briard filled stadiums he filled arenas a lot of guys today demand that you know demetrius andrade for instance would say you know i'm not getting the money i deserve a lot of fighters say that they're not getting the money they deserve or they're not getting whatever they deserve you know i should get more money more exposure but you get it by putting asses in the seats. We are put asses in the seats because he had power. He had knockout power. And he did damage with both hands all the time. And also, he was excited from the first round to the last round. There was no lull. We're going to take time off. You know, today when fighters will clinch and then the referee will break them and the fighter will take three or four steps backwards, you know, move his head around, adjust his trunks. They didn't do that back then. Fans didn't pay for that. They didn't have time for that. When the referee broke, he went at it right away. Now, Blazer says, I got Ray Robinson, but I'm not mad at Manny. Manny is the epitome of greatness. Yeah, a lot of people think Robinson's the greatest fighter pound for pound. He, he may very well be. Angel Dundee thought it was really Pep. His Pep did more things well than any other fighter he ever saw. Although Sandy Sadler beat him for the other four fights. I don't know. I, I still, the problem is when you say the greatest fighter pound for pound, people who are younger than me, I'm 62, I can look at fighters now today. They don't count or they haven't heard of a guy like George Dixon, who, who you know, who had upwards of 800 fights and won 95% of them. And, you know, would be fighting 10, 15, 20 times a month. Dixon, because he was black, had to fight while guys in his opponent's corner, corner men and fans would try to hit him in the legs with metal pipes and knives. So he had to keep the fight in the center of the room. Knowing that because he was black and his opponent was white, he could get killed actually for winning the fight and had to agree to lose the first seven or eight rounds, let his opponent bloody him. 
So under those circumstances, it would be hard for me to pick anyone other than George Dixon as the greatest fighter of all time. I think of the modern fighters, man, he would definitely be in the top 10 of all time, without a doubt. Okay, let's get back to our story. So uh, he got married. He married a, a woman named Minnie Florence uh, Baskin, and they had a child. And um, so he, he, you know, he, he had to fight. He had to keep fighting. And uh, Briard kept training all the time. This was his job. And he fought a really good fighter from Chicago, really well-schooled black fighter, young Jack Thompson for the National Boxing Association, undisputed World World Weight title, October 23rd, 1931. And he captured the title in Boston by a 15 round decision. And the referee was Johnny Brazo and Briard at the time that he won the World World Weight title, you know, he's from boxing, boxes and amateurs from the age of 12 on, he was 20 years old. Imagine what you were doing at 20, he was just a kid. And he had this swarming nonstop style and he just smothered Thompson. Thompson was taller. Everyone he fought was taller with longer arms. And he didn't give Thompson any room to get leverage on his jaws. He just stayed on him. Johnny Buckley said, get on him from the beginning and just keep pounding him to the body and bring it up to the head. He wouldn't allow Thompson to move away from him at any time. He didn't give Thompson enough room to let his hands go. And it was such a complete victory that the judges, three of the judges gave him 13 of the rounds, of the 15 rounds. One judge scored a uh, second round even, and the 14th round went to Thompson. And the difference in the fight, of course, was Briard's power. Briard, Briard dropped him three times. Actually dropped him four times, but the fourth knockdown was considered more of a throwdown than anything else because they were wrestling. But he sent him to the canvas twice in round 10. Uh, first times for a count two, second time for a count of nine. And Briard was one of those guys that, you know, when you fought him and you would clinch him, you know, he's still throwing punches. He's still moving you back. He, he's coming forward. He's still hitting you all the time. If he can't hit you in the body or the chin, he's hitting your arms. He's going to hit your hips. He's going to hit your shoulders. It's like Arthur Bidabia. He's going to give you a full body beat. And so... He also dropped Thompson in the seventh round uh, with a left hook to the heart. And those punches hurt, takes everything out of you. And as I said, the fourth knockdown was really a wrestling thing. So we threw him to the mat and it wasn't really counted. Uh, and it's an interesting fight. Briard's a man of many firsts. The fight's in, in Boston. First fight since 1920. Uh, very legal. Uh, that was legal in the state of Massachusetts. And uh, the first title fight in there for a very long time. And uh, he had him, two months later, imagine winning the title. Two months later, he knocks out Bucky Lawless, December 2nd, 1931, at the Boston Garden, 10 round bout. And it wasn't a welterweight title bout because both men were over the welterweight limit. Now, you know, when I looked at last night's fight between Gooder Biaf and Yard, Gooder Biaf fought six months ago against uh, Joe Smith. Yard fought less than two months ago, too soon. At that weight, even though he won and dominated his opponent, it's just too soon to put your body through that kind of work again. So he beats Bucky Lawless. Now dig this, dig this. Eight days after he beats Bucky Lawless, he goes to the public hall in Cleveland and he wins by disqualification over Paul Peroni, P-I-R-R-O-N-E. Now, Peroni, is in this, uh, he beats him in the seventh round. It's a 10-round bout. If you get a chance, look up Paul Peroni on Bob Sweat. Look at his picture. This is one tough mofo. This is a guy that came to kill you. And this fight was a non-title fight because Peroni weighed 154 pounds. Riard came in a half pound over the welterweight limit. Five days after, after beating Peroni by disqualification, five days, he's in Montreal. For our hometown fans, December 15th, 1931, the forum in Montreal. We're not talking Maurice Richard. We're talking way before that, the days of the great Howie Morins of the Montreal Canadiens. And it was a partisan French Canadian crowd. And it was a 10 round draw. I fought against the great, formidable Baby Joe Gans. Baby Joe Gans was in no way related to the original Joe Gans, but that was the name he used. And he was a magnificent fighter. And the referee was George Rivet, and they said all through the bout, 
Uh, Briard swarmed him, pounded him, but every time Briard would swarm, Briard would swarm him, you pound him to the body. Gans would lean back and just hammer Briard's jaw. But the punches made no difference to Briard. He just kept coming in and coming in. And eventually it was going to draw. And they both did a lot of damage to each other, especially in the eighth, ninth round when Briard kept coming forward through Gans' withering attack. But Gans couldn't stop and Briard couldn't stop Gans and, and Briard got a draw. And you have such a tough fight like that. And then a month later, because it's the depression and he needs the money, one month later, uh, he goes to Chicago, fights in the Chicago Stadium against Chicago born, but uh, a man who lived in, in California, Jackie Field, Jacob Finkelstein. Jackie Field is a slick, stick and move fighter. And he'd seen Briard fight. And he thought, if I square up against him like everyone else, he's going to beat the crap out of me. I can't do that. You know, I got to be like a matador with a bull. I got to make him lunge and we get out of his way and beat him. And that's what he did. Briard lost his title. He lost the World Trade title. He kept sticking and moving. And Briard would reach. And, you know, uh, Fields would, would uh, dock him, get out of the way. And I'm leading up to the Martel Field fight. And so he loses. He loses the welterweight title. He can't make the weight anymore. Um, five fights later, August 4th, 1932, he fights fellow Canadian future Hall of Famer, Jimmy McLaren. Now, McLaren was a bigger man. He's 5'7 and a half. Briard was only 5'5 five, five and a half, but he was physically stronger than McLaren. And he scored a split decision victory over him at Yankee Stadium. The referee and one judge gave it to Briard and the other judge from McClarnon. And it said Briard just pounded and batted McClarnon through the 10 rounds of primitive fighting. He was just physically too strong a guy. He was a middleweight in a welterweight's body, and McClarnon just couldn't take that kind of punishment uh, from him. Lefty Lou, that's what they called Briard, was just too strong. And after that, this big win over McClarnon, who was the biggest draw in boxing, he loses his next five, three of his next five fights. And then Lux shines on him again because in 1933, July 6, 1933, he wins a unanimous 10 round decision over the former undisputed world Network champion, Mickey Walker. Mickey Walker was managed by Jack Doc Kearns, who managed Jack Dempsey and the great Archie Moore. Mick and Kearns is one of the all time great rascals and rogues and managers in boxing history. And this was in front of 16,000 screaming fans in Boston. Walker was Irish. Briard was French Canadian, but Briard was living there. So the fans are behind him. Walker was still a formidable force, but each guy weighed in over 170 pounds. So the fight was contested at light heavyweight. And the big thing about this victory was it got Briard the title shot at Ben Jebby at the Polo Grounds in New York on Wednesday, August 9th, 1933. And this is for the New York State Athletic Commission. It was recognized as the boxing commission on the planet. It was their version of the world middleweight title. And the bout was scheduled for 15 rounds. Briard fought a very smart, aggressive fight. He smothered Jebby. He kept throwing shots to the body. And then he kept coming up over top with his left hook. Uh, hey, scrapbook, I'm doing fine. Uh, and I'm glad you're enjoying it. So he keeps coming on. I'm fine if I don't have another sneezing fit like I did just before we went on the air, 15 in a row. So I don't hope to repeat that. Never did it before in my life, never do it again. Um, so Jebby was in big trouble uh, throughout the fight. Briard kept hammering him. Sixth round, he wobbled him. He just pounded the hell out of him. And then in the seventh round, at the two, you know, he knocked him out at the 221 mark. He came, he hit him with a right uppercut and then left hook. And Jebby was out before he hit the canvas. And Briard becomes a two-time world champion, which was remarkable back then. And he was only 22. So two years before he hit the welterweight champ, now he's the world middleweight champ. And all of Canada is going crazy because it wasn't since George Dixon in the 1890s that this had happened before. We had Johnny Poulon at Bantamweight, Tommy Burns at Heavyweight, you know, and and many other great fighters along the way, but we had never had someone, you know, like 
Briar, who's a wealthier middleweight, you're getting up in the weights now, who'd won two world championships. We'd had Jack Delaney, who was the light heavyweight champ. So at the tender on the age of 82, he's a champ, world champion for the second time. And if you held the world title from the New York State Athletic Commission, it meant everything. In fact, that's what hurt Ali's when the New York State Athletic Commission illegally stole his title uh, in 1967. But that's another story. But unfortunately for Briard, he only made one successful defense of that title. Uh, one month after capture, one month. He wins the title. Today, a guy wins the title, and he'll take a year off, six months off, eight months off. He took one month off. He wanted to make money off his title. He fought the top-rated uh, German middleweight, Adolf Hauser, scoring an eighth-round TKO victory. And they said that Hauser was giving such a terrific beating that Briard was pounding him so heavily that at the end of the eighth round, Hauser just went, no, nine, 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 I'm done. I quit. I don't want to uh, yes, we should reach out, Scrapbook. Or, uh, and you can also go to Once Upon a Time in the Prize Ring with Lou Eisen and uh, talk about the, or see the articles I've written about a lot of these great fighters. Uh, so Briard beats the German, and he's the world middleweight champion. And when you have the title, especially during the Depression, you want to make money off of it. That's where you make your most money. The only fighter who made a lot of money before he won the title, well, there were two. Uh, Jimmy McLaren, because he was the biggest draw in the sport, and he would do the backflip after he won about. And Joe Lewis, because he was just all action and exciting and great fighter than ever walked the face of the surf. Um, Riyad lost a 15 round unanimous decision to the great Vince Dundee in a fight refereed by Johnny Martin, and he surrendered both the NBA National Boxing Association and the New York State Athletic Commission title to him in, in the process. And they said that Dundee won the fight. New York Times said he won the fight because Briard fought his typical savage fight, rushing and driving him back. And Dundee just sidestepped him and won with light jabs. He, he outpointed him. He didn't beat him up. He didn't hurt him. But he outpointed him. The heavy shots went to Briard. But the quantity of shots went to Dundee. And the verdict was unanimous. And um, uh, unfortunately... You know, he lost his very next fight after that to Tony Shuko. Tony Shuko is one of the unsung heroes in professional boxing. Great fight. And then he reeled off 16 victories uh, you know, in a row in his next 21 bouts. And then he beat future light heavyweight champion, Jewish fighter Bob Olin, who Eddie Futch told me was the bravest fighter he ever saw in his life. Bob Olin was just a tremendously tough guy. And he beat him twice by decision within three months. Bob Olin lost a very few men. So in November of 1935, he traveled to Paris, France, the challenge, and we're getting to it now, the lightly regarded Marcel Phil for the IBU, because Marcel Phil hadn't fought very many um, American fighters. And it was for the International Boxing Union World Middleweight title, which wasn't really expected. It was a ballet of sports. They had three fights, and all of which ended in controversy. Uh, the first meeting, Phil was awarded a very dubious THIL, Phil, a uh, very dubious unanimous decision victory, which was booed by the local French fans. And in fact, it was so booed that the referee, Robert Shiman, and the judges, Henri Petrie and Robert Weisberg, all required police protection when they left the arena. Even though the French fans were behind their own fighter, they knew this was a ripoff. Riard had beaten Phil and pounded him soundly in every round, but the judges bent over backwards for their own fighter. Uh, the next fight occurred December 20th, 1936 at the Palais de Sports. And this was uh, Briard's year later, his second crack at the IBU middleweight title. And he gave Phil, a, a, he, he was going in to knock him out. He gave him a real frightful beating. He just pounded him from pillar to post. And for the first three and a half knockdowns, he broke his nose. He had him bleeding over one eye, bleeding out of the mouth. He was just pounding him like he was pounding a heavy bag and full body attack, pounded him, broke one of his ribs, just beat the crap out of Phil. And, and Phil was going to be knocked out, and he knew it. And around four, uh, you can see in the tape, Briard lands a left hook to Phil's head, hits him, and Phil's head, I mean, bang. And his eyes roll, and what does Phil do? Grabs his crotch and goes to the ground, 
impounds the canvas and the referee disqualifies him for a low blow. And Briard's looking around and says, I hit him in the chin. I mean, if I hit him that hard in the chin that his testicles hurt, then it's a, it's a tremendous punch. It's not a low blow by any means, though. And it wasn't. But this had all the earmarks of a fixed fight. And this was a fixed fight. And I'm calling it that without a doubt because there was no low blow. Not at all. And this was a fight where it was determined by, you know, the officials, French boxing officials. And not for the first time, but their fighter was going to win. That's the way they thought of it. You know, this guy was coming from North America. And uh, although he was originally from Quebec, which considered itself at the time to really be part of Europe, in Canada, he, he, you know, he was disqualified and unrightly so, and, and, and unjustly so. And this isn't the first time. And a light heavyweight title bout between Battle and Siki, the singular Senegalese, who we've talked about before from Senegal, he had a fixed fight with George Carpanchi for the light heavyweight world title in the 20s. And the deal with Carpanchi was he said to, to, to Siki, we're not going to hurt each other, we're going to go 20 rounds. We'll throw punches. We won't hurt each other. You get to keep what you're getting paid. Plus, I'll give you what I'm getting paid. And they said, uh, that's great. That's fantastic. And then in the fourth round, or third round, excuse me, Carpanche starts to really go after Siki. And Siki in a clinch says, what are you doing? This was supposed to be a controlled exhibition. And he says, you know, F off, you N-word. And Siki gets angry, gets knocked down, gets up beats the hell out of Carpanche, knocks him out. And that was a, a, a fixed fight combat. This was a different thing. You know, Briard was a gentleman in and out of the ring. He was disappointed. He went over and shook the guy's hand. He didn't complain. but And he didn't scream or anything. He just said, I didn't hit him well. I know it. He knows it. And what's more, the fans knew. It. You know, so people can think what they want. So we're coming up to their third fight. The third fight, February 15th, 1937, was also for the undisputed International Boxing Union title. And because boxing was controlled by the mob, if you couldn't get a fight in the States for one of the titles, the middleweight title or you know, the State Athletic Commission title, uh, you could go to Europe and fight for the International Boxing Union title, which was controlled by the French mob. Now, any fighter that fought for the mob back then or any time, it wasn't their choice. People sometimes get angry at me and they'll say, how can you say Chuck Davey, for instance, was a mob fighter? It wasn't his choice. The mob came in, got your guy, and said, that's it. You're done. We manage him now. Get lost or die. And in fact, on my sub stack, uh, once upon a time in the prize ring, I'm going to post this week an article on the great Arthur King, Toronto lightweight, ranked above Mike Williams by Ring Magazine was the best in the world. He was managed by the Canadian Davy Yak, whose brother was the famous Baby Yak, the fighter. Davy Yak was the toughest guy anyone ever met. Uh, took Arthur King down to New York. Bang, bang, door is open. Blinky Palermo walks in to put down in his mouth and just says, he's my fighter now. Get lost. Go home. And Yak goes to pack his bags from the New York hotel and says, screw your bags. Get out. And Yak was never scared, but said that was the only time in his life ever that he was scared. This is the mob. They didn't play around. You screwed with them, they killed you. They didn't make idle threats. And so any fighter that fought 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, and even beyond, you had to pay what they wanted. That's just the way it went. And, and, and one way of trying to escape that was going to, to Europe. And so Briard goes to Europe, and they have this, this third fight. And they're talking about how the first two fights went. It was scheduled for 15 rounds. And it went like the other two fights. Briard, the fight starts. Briard starts very strong. He's fighting from a crowd. Briard was very smart. Johnny Buckley was smart. Uh, they took the advice of Charlie Goldman. If you're a short fighter, five, five and a half, what you want to do is fight from a crowd. That way you make yourself less of a target. You're a small target anyways. But from an exaggerated crouch, the other guy has uh, less of a target to aim for. And so he was fighting from a crouch. He's coming in. He's landing his rights to the body. He's pawing with his jab, but he's throwing that left hook like a slingshot. So he's getting the jab out there to block his vision. And, you know, like, like Thomas Hearn's right hand that knocked out Roberto Durant. So he's hitting with that left hook in every round. And every time he lands flush in the jaw, he's staggering him and Phil just grabs on. He's not, he's not letting go. And referee's like, you can get your hand off. 
you know, screw you. I'm not taking my hand. Get your hand up. Nope. I'm not falling down. And he keeps doing this. And he's pounding Phil. And, you know, his corner's getting excited and the fans are getting excited. Briard's going to knock him out. There's no way because Briard, Briard is just going for his head. He's not going for the body. He's hitting him in the shoulders and elbows and head. You know, he's almost ignoring the body. And he's using these whipping punches, you know, the right uppercut, which is what he would throw when he was in close, which was powerful. You know, he hit him with the right uppercut and then bang over at the left. And it was only a matter of time. And after the sixth round, they're thinking Phil can't come out for anymore. He's got nothing left. He's got nothing in his legs. So he can't move. He's got a standard. He's a strong guy himself. But he's trying to stand there and match for yard punch for punch. He can't not do it. He doesn't have the strength or the skill to do it. And so after the fifth round, it looks like he's finished. He's in the corner. He's bleeding. You know, he's bleeding from the mouth, from the nose. He's, he's sitting there and Corner goes out and tells him what to do. He wants to move. But the minute the bell starts, you know, he comes out and bang, three yards right on him again, head on the chest, pushes him into the corner and just keeps pounding him to the shoulders, to the arms. And then it hits him with a left hook and staggers him. Another left hook and, and Phil goes down. He goes down on one knee and then he turns around, falls down completely grabs his groin, rolling around. And the referee originally awards the fight to Briard because he's, he was standing right there. He saw the punch hit the chin. And then he confers with the judges and then he changed his decision and he said it was a low blow. And Briard just said, watch the tape. I didn't hit him a body shot all night. This was a left hook to the chin, double left hook. And it was a sizzling shot, knocked him out. And they called it a... a uh, a disqualification. They took it away from Briard, and Briard had to laugh because this this was fit. You know, all three fights were fit. Briard wasn't going to win. He knocks the guy out. He knocked him out because Phil couldn't get up, and they still won't give it to him. So it's like Larry Merchant said: when the other guy's backyard, sometimes you got to score a knockout just to get a decision. So he he. It was just, it was disgusting. And Phil kept the title. He goes to New York and he fights Fred Apostoli uh, for the world middleweight title. And he's winning the fight in New York, which is unbelievable. He's winning the fight, but he has to quit after the 10th round because he's getting, he's got a huge cut over his left eye and they can't close it. So they stop the fight and then Phil retired. But during the fight, Apostoli hits him, you know, to the body and he's claiming, you know, he's fouled. And the referee just said, don't even try that. You bring that up again, I'll disqualify you. That doesn't work over here. You got to fight. And he was winning the fight. But if he hadn't got caught, you know, if he hadn't got the big cut, then, you know, he would have ended up actually beating Apostoli. Uh, by the way, a side note here. Uh, uh, Briard fought... All the best middleweights of the time in light heavyweights, Gus Lesnovich, Anton Christofaridis. Now, Don Dunphy, the great announcer, I once asked him, what do you do when you have Christofaridis fighting Gus Lesnovich? You know, and he said, well, it's Anton Christofaridis and Gus Lesnovich. So I just called him Anton and Gus because I couldn't call them Christofaridis and Lesnovich because the fight would have been over by the times I got the names out. So, so Briard does this. He fights on... He continues to fight after losing this fight. And um, it's it's sad because he, you know, he really did win it. But uh, he keeps fighting on. And when he loses that fight, there's 12,000 people there at the Palais de Royale. And they just throw a complete riot. They go berserk because they know that, that the other guy won. This isn't fair. They don't want to be known for that. Uh, in his final 19 fights, he, 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 after he loses to him, he ended up with seven wins, two draws, and 10 losses. His heart wasn't really in it. But look at the middleweights he faced. Teddy Aras, Gus Lesnovich, the great Lloyd Marshall, part of the Black Murderers Row, one of the greatest fighters ever to have lived. Some people watching this won't know him, but Lloyd Marshall is an all-time great. And also Georgie Abrams, Georgie Freedom Abrams, one who Angelo Dundee called the greatest middleweight he ever saw. And uh, 
he had a long career and he was only knocked out once by Tiger Jack Fox at the Boston Garden near the end of his career on uh, February 18th, 1938. He got stopped in the seventh round. Uh, his last fight uh, was his second fight and second loss to Holocaust survivor Henry Tomowski, uh, 1940, January 12th, on Mechanics Hall in Worcester, Massachusetts. And then he called it a career after that. He was 28 when he retired. Think about that. Guys today, you know, Bitter BF was 38 a week ago when he won last night. He was 28 and he was done. He had over 100 fights. And so he worked as a physical fitness instructor in the Army during World War II. And his final ledger was 107 wins, 50, 66 by knockout, 29 losses, two draws, two no decisions. And he died from Alzheimer's disease, unfortunately, in Halifax, Plymouth, Massachusetts, September 14th, 1984. Years later, on 2006, he was inducted into the International Boxing Hall of Fame. And I was there that day. I was sitting with Angel Dundee, and I was in tears because I got to see a Canadian that I really adored and worshipped go into the International Boxing Hall of Fame. And it's well deserved. He's also a member of the World Boxing Hall of Fame. Thanks to my uh, late great friend Steve Lott, which is located in Nevada. Marcel Phil uh, fought on, or he quit, excuse me, after the fight that he lost. And he um, he, he kept fighting, and, and, or excuse me, he didn't keep fighting. I keep uh, uh, um, contradicting myself. So he loses to Apostoli and he quits. What's interesting about him is, when he was training, he lived in the Soviet Union and he trained fighters there. So in 1935 and 1936, if he'd done that and lived in the States, he probably would have been banned. Uh, he retired at the age of 33 and he was active. He was a corner man. He was a, a member and the honorary president of the DF Boxing Club. And he retired to a village in Cannes on the French Riviera. You can't get a better last few years of life to live than that. Unfortunately, he died August 14, 1968. Phil was only 64. He'd had two car accidents the previous three years, and he was seriously injured. He never recovered from that. Um, and he's buried at the Grand Just Cemetery. And he was inducted the year before uh, Lou Briard was into the International Boxing Hall of Fame in 2005. And there's a sports stadium named after him in the city of Reims and also a street in St. Dizier. Uh, you can actually see this fight. They don't have the whole fight. I don't know why they don't have the whole fight. When I did Cinderella Man, Angelo and I watched the whole fight from beginning. And Angelo said, "What? What? Do you, I mean, what can you do? They put a gun to 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 uh, Riyard's head. You couldn't have robbed them any better than they did in France. But what could you do at that time? You're the minority. You're the you and the other Americans in your corner. You're a Canadian." Two Americans in your corner, and this guy's got the French mob behind him. You're not going to win. And unfortunately, he didn't. But one of the all-time great fights, Riard is one of the all-time great fighters, certainly one of the greatest Canadian fighters of all time. And this week on my uh, Once Upon a Time in the Prize Ring, uh, which you can access, I'll get you the exact address in a second here. It's HTTPS colon or semicolon slash slash lueisen.substack.com. You can read about another great Canadian fighter, the great Arthur King, and uh, well worth reading about. Uh, so go to that. You can get a yearly subscription or you can get a monthly subscription. And there are other articles that I post that you can just click on and see. I hope you enjoyed this today. I wanted to give you a full background of both Briard and Marcel Phil leading up to that fight. Sometimes people will talk about the fight, but you got to know both men leading up to it, and then at the point in time where they clash. Um, it was really a highlight for both men because Briard never challenged for the title again. And Phil went to New York and lost to Apostoli. And it was really, you know, the end of the line for both men. So both these guys deserve to be in the Hall of Fame. I never really gave Phil the respect that he deserved. But he truly was a great fighter, although I didn't like the fact that he claimed that he was fouled every time someone knocked him down. But, you know, I guess in that regard, you have to give him credit for doing whatever he thought that he could do to win the title. I'm Lou Eisen. This has been Ring Talk. I hope you enjoyed it. Next week, we'll come back at you with another great fight. Enjoy the rest of your weekend. Have a good night.